My name is uh, Brian Schneider. I'm a naturalist at the Aldo ne Leopold Nature Center. Um, I've been a naturalist there for four years, um, and I am originally from Wauwatosa, Wisconsin. If any of you have ever heard of it, it is a suburb of Milwaukee. Um, so that's where I grew up, um, and then I came to Madison uh, for college, UW-Madison. Uh, I graduated with a degree in zoology and environmental studies, um, and then after graduating, I became an environmental educator at the Nature Center, um, and I've been there since. Um, my experience with birds um, really took off in my last year of college, um, so the last five years really, um, and since then I've led uh, some bird hikes with uh, one of the handouts that I gave you. I'll talk about that at the end. Um, so I've led a couple bird hikes, and I would say um, I like birding probably the best out of anybody else at the Nature Center. I'm known as the bird guy. Um, so that I'll take as my uh, claim there. Uh, so that's just a little bit about me. Um, just to get a little bit of audience participation, I'm used to working with uh, kids, so I interact with uh, them a lot. So this might be a little uh, interactive if you guys can work with me here. Um, just by a show of hands, uh, who considers himself uh, like a very beginning level birder? All right. Does anybody consider themselves uh, more than that, like a, a pretty decent birder? All right. Just to get a gauge, that's good. Thank you. Um, so we'll start out by talking about what is birding exactly. Um, it can be as simple as just going outside and listening, looking to see what you have in your backyard um, at the birds you have around you. Um, the formal definition uh, is a form of wildlife observation in which the observation of birds is a recreational activity or citizen science. Um, it can be done with the naked eye through a visual enhancement device like binoculars and telescopes or by listening uh, for bird sounds or what's even been uh, more popular in the last couple of years, uh, it's called virtual birding. Um, whether that's looking at bird cams, um, there's lots of good online bird cams that show bird nests, um, or people have even turned to Google Street View birding as a virtual uh, birding tool. Um, over 20 million people in the United States bird, uh, making it pretty much the most popular hobby out of any of the outdoor hobbies. Um, including hunting and fishing, um, and it, it's just really uh, growing in numbers too. Um, at any given time, where you are, there's usually about 100 different species of birds within, say, a 25-mile radius of you, um, and that changes throughout the year. Uh, there could be more um, during different times of the year, but pretty much at any given time, at least 100 different species of bird. Um, each year in Wisconsin, we see roughly 300 species uh, come through, whether that means that they're here year-round or they're just passing through on migration. Um, North America has seen over 900 species of bird, um, and then worldwide, there's over 10,000 species of birds. Um, so we're going to focus today on what birds we can see in our area, um, how we can work to identify them better, um, and some of those skills uh, that we'll use out in the field to identify birds. All right, so why is birding so popular? Why are 20 million people in the United States birding and even more worldwide? Um, there's lots of reasons. Uh, number one, it's fun. I think it's fun. Um, it's awesome to just get outside um, as many times as you can and to keep track of what you're seeing. Um, it has a level of satisfaction once you get better each time you go out and you identify a new bird um, and you can, you can build confidence. Um, and it can be competitive if you want it to be. Uh, some people, maybe competition, they don't really care about that. I tend to be a little more competitive than others. Uh, so I do like to uh, turn birding into a competition with myself um, and with other people. Uh, I have a friendly wager with someone that I work with at the Aldo Leopold Nature Center who is going to see more different species of birds this year. Um, so it can be competitive if you want it to be. Uh, some of you maybe have seen this movie. It's called The Big Year. This picture um, is from that movie. 
Uh, that can show you just how competitive birding can be. Um, the big year is considered um, an event that from January 1st to December 31st, you see as many different species of birds as you can in North America. Um, and so this movie is about that, that competition. Um, and it's really a good movie uh, if you guys get a chance to see it. It's pretty funny. Um, it's healthy. It gets you outside. Um, it gets you moving. It gets you hiking. Um, it's healthy to get outside a lot. Um, studies have shown that getting out in nature reduces stress, um, helps with memory, um, all sorts of benefits of getting outside in nature. Uh, it can be something that you can do with your family. Um, it's a great family activity. Um, I used to go outside and hike as I was a kid um, with my parents. It's a great opportunity uh, to get outside together. Um, or you can go out with friends. Um, there's lots of birding groups where you can meet new people um, and get to know them just by going out and birding together. And sometimes uh, going by yourself is nice too. Um, if you've ever just gone by yourself on a walk in the woods, um, that can be a great experience. Um, so lots of different reasons why birding is uh, so popular. All right, so now that I've convinced you that birds are cool and birding is awesome, uh, let's get to some of the things you'll need um, if you want to pursue birding a little bit more. Uh, the good thing about birding is you don't need too many things. You could go outside right now if you wanted and just go look and listen for birds. Um, if you want to get a little more serious into birding, um, there are some things that you will need initially. Uh, like many outdoor activities, there might be a high initial cost, but after that, it's free to go hiking pretty much everywhere you go, um, unless you're going to state parks. Um, so number one that I'm going to cover is binoculars. Um, I'm going to go briefly over the different types of binoculars and what some of those numbers mean when you see the different types of binoculars. Um, I'm going to go over field guides, um, bird feeders. Uh, there's lots of different types of bird feeders and it can be a great tool uh, for finding birds. Um, we're gonna go over some beginning skills you might wanna use uh, when you're finding birds. And then lastly, how to keep track of what you're seeing. All right, so birding binoculars. Um, I like to say any pair of binoculars is better than no pair. Um, so even if you think you have a bad pair of binoculars at home, it's still better than nothing. Um, binoculars will help you a lot in the field if you want to become serious about birding and you're going out walking around, especially small birds that are flying around um, high in the treetops that you probably won't be able to get good looks at with your naked eye. You're going to need some sort of visual enhancement to get a better look at that bird. Um, if you are going out and getting new binoculars, there are many things that you want to consider. Um, you want to look at two numbers and binoculars, most binoculars are labeled this way. Um, you'll see eight by 25 or eight by 42. Um, and a lot of times people don't really know what those numbers mean. I didn't at first when I was looking at binoculars. Um, so the first number is going to represent the magnification. Um, how much of a zoom are you going to see in your binoculars? So we see in our example there, the seven X or the 10 X, um, you can see that that is more magnified. Uh, on the right, the 10x. The next number is going to be um, the field of view. Um, and the higher the number, it means the more light is going to be let in for you to see. Um, so you can see the 32 millimeter compared to the 50 millimeter. The 50 millimeter is going to be brighter. Um, and that's going to let you see the colors of the birds better. Um, it'll let you see birds better in low sunlight. Um, so you can get binoculars anywhere in this range. Um, I tend to start out in the, uh, the budget range there, the beginner binoculars. Um, I listed the top, what's known as the, or what was set as the top um, binocular for each range. Um, and I also think I included that on the back of the handout. Um, but if you guys are interested in getting binoculars, um, those are three different types that, depending on what your budget is, um, you could probably start out by looking at. But you can look at, uh, do your own research online. There's lots of different um, 
things that you want to look at for binoculars. How heavy they are, you don't want to walk around with heavy binoculars hanging around your neck the whole time. Um, just how they feel. Um, so it's quite a process if you really want to get the right type of binocular if you are uh, getting serious about birding. Um, because they will become uh, your best friend out in the field. All right, your other best friend out in the field will be your field guide. Um, there are many, many different types of field guides, um, and you can do your own research as to what kind of field guide you would want. Some are organized by color, some are organized by uh, state, or what type of bird, uh, what family they belong to. Um, but I think that the one of the best uh, additions that we have of field guides is the Sibleys. Uh, I have an example here that you guys can page through at the end if you want to. Um, this is my bird guide that I use most often. Um, Sibley Birds has lots of good editions of bird guides. Um, the Stokes Field Guide to Birds in North America is also pretty popular. Um, that's a good one. And Peterson Field Guide to North America is uh, another one that I see uh, most often. Uh, another thing that we can use now with our phones, and I find very helpful out in the field, if you don't want to carry a field guide book with you, um, you can use an app. And my favorite app to use is the Merlin Bird ID. Um, this app, you can, if you can get a picture of a bird with your phone, um, it can actually, it's starting to get software to recognize and tell you what kind of bird that is. Um, but you can also put in a list of where you were, when you saw it, you can put the colors, the shape, um, what it was doing, where, uh, what habitat it was in. Um, you put all those in and it'll spit out a list back to you of um, the most likely bird that it would be. Um, and then you can just look at the pictures and see if you can find a match. Um, so that's, I think, my favorite app to use is the Merlin Bird ID. Um, and the basic set, uh, that one is free. Um, so that's a good one. You can buy uh, bird sets of if you want all of North America or if you just want the Midwest. Um, but that is a free app um, and my favorite to use. Sibley also has a, an app. Um, I don't use that one, but I know people that do and really like it. Um, iBird, I believe, is pretty new, um, but that's another app you can use. Um, and Audubon has a few bird apps as well. Um, some of those are better if you want to listen uh, to bird songs rather than look at the pictures. Um, but Merlin, for me, they have the pictures, the sounds, everything all in one. Um, so that's the one that I would recommend. All right, so you have your binoculars, you have your bird guide, you're ready to look for birds. Make birds come to you. Uh, if you have a bird feeder or any space in your backyard that you can use as a bird feeder, it's a great tool um, to have birds that you can sit still and look at. Um, because if they're on their feeder, um, usually they're pretty close to uh, your window that you can look out and get really good looks at birds that sometimes you wouldn't be able to get to out in the field. Um, I find that it's best to learn birds by just sitting at your window with your bird guide and your binoculars and identifying what type of bird is coming to your bird feeder. You might get one species, you might get two, three, four, um, but just learn birds starting out that way. I find that that's the easiest. Um, there are different types of bird feeders based on what types of birds you want to attract, based on what habitat you have around you to provide. Um, the one on the top is called a suet feeder. Um, and that's just kind of like a bird cake almost. Uh, it, it's stuck together and you put it in the suet holder and that depending on what type of suet you get, the suet blocks, the suet cakes can come in all different forms to attract different types of birds throughout different types. Uh, times of the year. Um, oftentimes the ones in the winter time are going to attract woodpeckers uh, like the downy woodpecker we see here on um, this bird suet. Uh, another type is your standard perching bird seed feeder that can attract lots of different types of wild birds. On the left there's all different types of styles uh, for that. Um, and then the one on the right uh, is a sock and it usually holds thistle seed which uh, finches really like to eat so that is um, a thistle feeder with um, American goldfinches um, eating from it and depending on 
what you have to provide at your um, location, house, apartment. Um, birds like at least one shelter nearby that they can fly to from your feeder. If it's out in the middle of a field without a tree or a shrub, you might not see as many birds. Um, so try to put your feeder where it's within about 10 to 20 feet of some sort of shelter that the bird can fly to. Um, I live in an apartment on the second story. I just have a window and I have a free feeder that has suction cups um, to the window and I just reach out and fill it up that way. And I have trees nearby and birds will fly from the trees, land on the feeder and fly away. Um, but I think it's because of those trees there. Otherwise, if it was just out in the open, I don't know if I would get any birds at my feeder. Yep, so on the left side, that is a red-breasted nuthatch. Um, not as common as the other type of nuthatch that we see um, around here, which is a white-breasted nuthatch. Um, red-breasted nuthatches are irregular visitors, usually in the wintertime. Um, and then the other one is a downy woodpecker. Yep, and you guys, uh, in your handouts, which we can talk about at the end too, um, those are just random uh, birds that we can see most often in the springtime. It's not every single bird that we can see here in the springtime. Uh, I just chose um, about 20 of the most common ones that we can see, um, and we'll go over what those are. Did you have a question? Yes. Um, my suet was ignored this year, even during the really cold times. And um, I don't know if it's it can uh if it's sealed it should be fine um <laughs> that yeah that's a good question um yeah I, it could have been stale if it was out a while um but if it right away um i found that birds can be irregular at times um i have or i see lots of people asking questions like usually my feeder is full of birds and then this season I haven't seen any. Um, so it, it's not uncommon for that to happen. Some of the reasons are unknown. It might have been weather related, it might have been migration related, it might have been feeder related. Um, maybe a, a hawk moved into your area um, that have scared some of the birds away. Um, but yeah, so there could be lots of different reasons for that to happen, but it, it does happen. Uh, I see a lot of people post that no birds visited my feeder. Um, so it, it's, it's tough to predict. All right, so once you identify or see a bird, let's say you're looking at your bird feeder, you see a bird land at it, and you have your binoculars ready, you get a good look at it. There are obviously lots of different parts of a bird. Um, and when you want to identify a bird, I would say the first thing you want to do, the best thing, is get a look at its head. Um, you can get the head color, you can get the head pattern, and then you can also get the beak. Um, because a lot of different types of birds, um, you can put them into different categories based on what their beak looks like. Um, and that'll help you identify. Uh, so when you're looking at a bird, you want to try to get the shape, and that includes the head, the body, the tail, the feet, um, and the eyes. I know there's lots of different parts here and it's kind of overwhelming. Um, but once you, once you get that into that rhythm of looking at a bird and seeing if you can uh, look at what its beak looks like, look at, look at what its eyes look like, um, the pattern on the head, that will really help you get that image in your head to look up in your guide or your app uh, what type of bird you're seeing. Um, Birds, uh, does anybody know a bird around here that has the crest, like in that picture? Golden waxwings? Or what are, cedar waxwings. Yep, so the cedar, yep, the cedar waxwings have a crest. Uh, what does that bird in the middle remind you of? Cardinal. A cardinal, right? So you can sometimes see the shape of the beak. Cardinals have that really good uh, cone uh, beak for eating seeds. Um, so they have a nice big bill compared to the top bird, which is going to be a thin 
a thin beak that wouldn't be really good for eating seeds, but maybe good for eating insects. Um, so try to get a shape of the beak and the head. Um, then you can move on to the rest of the body. What colors do you see? What patterns? Um, and the tail. Um, the cool thing about birds is you can look at their body parts and they give you a good clue as to where they live or what they eat. Um, if you see a bird, obviously, with webbed feet walking around, you think, well, that's a bird that likes to live near the water. Um, if you see a bird with really sharp talons, you know that's probably going to be in the raptor group. Um, so you can kind of get used to seeing some of these patterns in birds and grouping them um, into what type of bird you think they are, and then you can narrow it into what species exactly. Um, another thing, if you see a bird flying, birds have different flight patterns. Um, depending on what field guide you get, uh, they will show the flight pattern. Some birds fly in a straight line with rapid um, wing beats. Some just beat like one per every 20 yards they go. Uh, some birds will fly up and down. What's that called? Uh, what's what called? Uh, I don't know the exact, yeah, I don't know the exact name for that off the top of my head, uh, but one, a couple of different species of birds around here that do that are the goldfinch. They'll kind of fly up and down and up and down, and uh, woodpeckers tend to do that too. Chickadee? Uh, chickadee, yep. Yeah, so they'll, they'll, yep, yeah, the finches will do that. The finch groups, yeah, they'll, they'll do a couple beats up and then they'll rest. Um, and it all has to do with flight dynamics and saving energy, and birds have found different ways to, uh, to save that energy. If you see a soaring bird, uh, it's probably not going to be a chickadee uh, <laughs> soaring high up in the air. So you can narrow it down based on, based on what the bird is, is doing in flight. Um, another thing is time of year. Um, and I think that's a really big part. Uh, once you get to know birds, and know when you can see certain birds. I know that in January, it's very unlikely for me to see a Baltimore Oriole or an indigo bunting. So anytime I go out for a hike, I have predetermined a list in my head of birds that I'm most likely to see. Um, and that really helps it narrow down. And once you see a bird, you can be like, all right, uh, it was finch-like. I think it's either a house finch or a goldfinch, but it's not going to be any of the warblers here in the wintertime. Um, so knowing what birds we can see during different times of the year helps a lot. Any other questions uh, about looking at these bird IDs? I know there's a lot to take in on these photos, um, but the color and the shape of the head and the beak um, are really important. Um, but once you get to those silhouettes, of the birds, that's when you can start grouping them in and going from there. All right, so let's put this into practice really quick. We have three different birds. They all, if you just take a quick glance, they're little and brown, right? They all look pretty similar. Um, but if you really get a chance to look at the details of these birds, you can see that they're actually quite different. Um, if you compare the beak of the upper left one, the one that's labeled winter wren, to the beak of the one on the right, which is a house sparrow, something that we see far too often around here, actually. Um, and you look at the conical beak of the house sparrow, it's big and chunky, compared to the thin beak of the wren. So you can see that the beak shape is different, the beak color is different. Um, and then you can move on to uh, the body. And you can see that the house sparrow has those dark, patches on their wings, the black streaks um, on their back. Uh, move on to the tail. Compare the tails. House sparrow tail is a little bit longer. The winter wren is known for having a really tiny, short, stubby tail. Um, the winter wren has been described as a golf ball with a, with a tail. Um, it's, it, uh, it can be. It's not common, but it, does, uh, it can be found around here. Um, and then the Carolina wren, which is even less common around here, uh, has that thick white eye stripe above the head or above the eye, um, and has a long curved beak. Um, so at first glance, all three of these birds look very much alike, but if you take the time to look at the detail of each of these birds, um, which is something if, if you're in the field with binoculars, you can get used to getting those field mark IDs down. Um, and also if you get a camera uh, that 
can zoom in enough, that is a really helpful uh, tool as well, uh, because then you can look at the bird without it moving. Obviously, that's easier. Um, so yeah, once you get down to the, the details, you'd notice that some of those field markings um, are pretty easy to spot once you take the time to look at the beak. All right, a couple birds around here that still can trip me up um, are tricky. Uh, you might notice as you're going out and looking through your field guides that two birds are different species, but they look almost exactly the same. Um, and they're not always going to be perching side by side like that in a nice way for you to uh, distinguish um, what they are. So does anybody know what we have on the left? Those, there's two different species. Yep, so these are two woodpeckers that we can find here year round. Uh, they're both pretty common. The downy is slightly, slightly more common than the uh, hairy. Um, so the downy woodpecker, since it's right next to the hairy in this case, we can look at their uh, distinguishing features. What do you notice about the downy compared to the hairy? It's smaller, right? Um, what else? Look, yeah, so we look at that, the first go-to ID, the head and the beak. That beak of the downy is about a quarter to a half the size of the full head. Um, compared to the hairy woodpecker, the beak is about the full length of the head. Um, so it's a, a much longer, heavier beak and just overall um, a bigger size. Obviously, out in the field, um, if you see one of these, most of the time they're not going to be right next to each other, so they can be pretty hard. Um, so I think the best ID for this one is looking at that beak. Is that beak longer or as long as about the width of its head or is it much shorter? Um, and that can help you determine whether it's a downy or a hairy woodpecker. Yes? So I'm wondering how that hairy woodpecker got its name. That is a good question that I do not have the answer for. <laughs> yes. Um, Yep. That's right. Yeah, so downies, downies seem to be a little more tame, if you will, compared to harries, which are more flighty. They seem to be more busy. Um, yeah, that's a good observation, too. Yes? Yep, so another uh, distinguishing feature between birds is whether they are male and female. Sometimes birds will look completely different, the male and female. Sometimes they'll look nearly identical. Um, in this case, uh, the females do not have the red patch on the back of their head, and the males do. Um, another thing that can make it tricky is juvenile plumage in birds. Uh, sometimes immature males can look a lot like females of that species, um, but that is getting a little more advanced than I want to get to today. Um, but yeah, different uh, sexes of birds can look different. Um, all right, the ones on the right, does anybody know what we have here? Or anybody know one of them? They are types? All right, so we're using our skills here of looking at the head. We notice that it's a sharp, curved beak. We look at those talons. We know that it's in the hawk family. Um, these are two hawks that, to me, I am really hard time distinguishing out in the uh, field. But the one on the left is a Cooper's hawk. Um, that's a little bit more common than the other one that we have here. Uh, they are big predators of smaller birds. So if you see, if you have a bird feeder that has smaller birds, usually you see Cooper's hawks uh, flying through and trying to trying to get a meal. Um, Sharp shinned is the other hawk on the right hand side. Um, those are also uh, bird uh, predators. That's their main their main go to food. Um, Sharp shinned hawks are slightly smaller um, than the Cooper's hawk. Uh, and if you look at their heads, the Cooper's hawk has like a dark cap, and the sharp shinned doesn't really have that, that dark cap right on top of its head. Um, there's also some minor differences in the tail. Uh, the Cooper's hawks tend to have a little bit more of a rounded tail, where the sharp shinned hawk has a little bit more of a squared off tail. Um, but this is an example of when you're getting more serious into birding and you're trying to distinguish, this is a, a really hard one to, uh, to determine. 
All right, so here are just a couple common birds around Madison. I know some of these are on the handout that I gave you. Um, let's just go through really quick one at a time based on what we've learned on how to ID the head and the tail. Just give me some um, descriptions of what you see in that first picture in the upper left. You, predator, all right, so it has a, what kind of beak? Yeah, curved, sharp, pointy beak. That sends us to a predator. What do you notice about its tail? Red. All right. So that is a red-tailed hawk. Awesome. Uh, middle bird on the top. Uh, this is one that we covered already. Yep. So that is a house sparrow. Um, we do have lots of different types of sparrows that we can see around Madison. Um, unfortunately, most of the time in the urban areas, we see house sparrows. And I say unfortunately uh, because they are invasive. There's a whole story that maybe once we get to questions and answers about uh, uh, the invasiveness of house sparrows. Um, we can talk about that later. Uh, but yeah, the middle one is a house sparrow. What about the one on the right? Yeah. Yep, so we have a good example of male and female looking pretty different. Um, the male mallard, the female mallard. Uh, bottom left, blue jay. Awesome, so we see that crest, um, that uh, longer, longer beak. Uh, Bottom center, my favorite bird, great horned owl. Yep, really fierce predator. Um, they're really hated cool to see. Crows. They what? Hated by crows. They are hated by crows. That is true. Yep. Um, we'll talk about that too. Uh, and then bottom right, yeah, black capped chickadee. Awesome. These are all birds that we can see year round in Wisconsin. Spring, summer, winter, fall. We can see these birds. The mallards, you'll just have to go somewhere where there's open water. But there is open water in Madison in the winter if you go to the right spot. All right, so lastly, you've identified some birds. You know what they are. Um, some useful tools that I found is writing down and keeping track of what you're seeing. Um, that'll just help you build your um, bird confidence or bird knowledge. Um, and it'll help you see what uh, you're seeing during different times of the year. Um, whether you want to do that, writing it down in a journal, um, that's fine. I do that sometimes. But I have found that if you want to keep it digital, the best uh, website for that is anything or is eBird.org. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of eBird. Couple people. All right. So eBird.org is a great tool. I'm just going to show you guys really quick. So this is run by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Um, really good, uh, probably the best program uh, for ornithology. Um, they do a lot and a lot of online resources you can find through Cornell. But eBird, you can make an account, um, and it keeps track of your lists. You can either enter it through your computer, or you can download the app and enter it through your phone. Um, but it knows your location, it knows the time of the year, and if you pull it up, it'll give you a list of the birds that you can see in that area at the time that you're out. Um, so it already has a pre-made list of uh, possible bird sightings, um, and you can go through and you can hit one, two, a hundred, however many number you saw of different species, and then you enter it into a checklist, and it's used for citizen science. Um, so scientists at Cornell are looking at uh, how birds move and migrate. Um, and this is about, uh, I want to say in the last, it probably started about 15 years ago, but in the last 10 years, eBird has really taken off and scientists have found out all new uh, cool things about birds uh, using this citizen science. Just people out birding, entering data, um, and it's really helping the scientists out. Um, but then it also keeps track of what you have seen and where and when um, so I can look here at my stats, and it's told me that I have seen 221 different species of birds in the time that I've been recording on eBird. Um, and you can look at all the checklists that you had. Um, so you can explore different species and where they're being seen. Uh, you can look at species maps where they're seen during different times of the year. You can explore regions. You can enter in Dane County, see what people are seeing and where. Yes. 
websites really taking off? Was that pun intentional? <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you caught that. It wasn't intentional, but thank you. Uh, somebody give me a species of bird. Any species. Junko. Junko. All right. So dark-eyed junko is the one that we see around here. And they are a winter visitor. Um, some of you might notice them popping up in your backyards in the winter time. That's usually a sign that winter is coming. And when they are gone, that's usually a sign that spring is here. Uh, they also feed off the ground. They do. Yep. Yeah, they definitely prefer uh, feeding from the ground. So you'll see a little dark uh, black and white gray bird like this right here. If you've ever seen that feeding on the ground in the wintertime, that's a junco. Um, and so I could look at the range map here. And I can type in, so it's already put to dark eyed junco. I can put current year and so you could put it to any date range you wanted i'm setting it to the current year so any juncos that have been entered into ebird since january 1st i'll set the date range and then you just zoom in so this is showing us the frequency of where they're being seen darker purple is more frequent and i can zoom in to madison and it'll eventually, there's a lot of sightings here, so it could take a while to zoom in. You can see every single sighting of a dark-eyed junco and see where it was that was entered into eBird. Um, so this can be really helpful if you're looking for a certain type of bird that you've never seen before um, and you want to see where is this uh, being seen. Um, and then maybe you can find someone to date, a fellow birder. Uh, yep. <laughs> you could do that too. Yeah, it, it can be used for bird tinder if, if you want. Um, so yeah, this is, this is just one species. You could put in anything you want. So this is a great tool uh, to use to find where birds are being seen. Um, and it's, it's really cool to see uh, just like the migration patterns. And if I were to type in Baltimore Oriole, you would see nothing for this year. And actually, I think one was spotted in Wisconsin. But you would see barely anything, and they'd all be down in Central America, all the sightings. And then if you were to do it in May, it would all be in the northern half of the United States and into Canada. So it's cool to see that movement happen. I'm not sure if it was eBird, but a few weeks ago, I, um, somebody took advantage of the hummingbird migration. Yep. That was neat. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Use that uh, to your advantage to know what to look for. Yep. Yeah. And actually, um, like I mentioned, a lot of uh, migrating species, their routes are being like remapped because of entries from eBird um, because scientists are realizing, oh, this bird travels farther east when they're migrating than we thought. Um, so it's, it's a really good citizen science tool. Um, and really good for uh, your birding experience. Uh, so that's through the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Another thing that I find useful is the um, Facebook groups. If anybody uses Facebook, there is a Wisconsin Birding um, and Birds of Wisconsin uh, Facebook group. Um, and that oftentimes has pictures with either a label as to what it is, so that's just helping you look through and say, oh yeah, dark-eyed junco, um, or yeah, oh yeah, uh, hairy woodpecker. Um, and sometimes if you have a picture of a bird you don't know what it is, people will post it and say, what is this? And everybody can help out and comment, and people have discussions as to what they think it is based on the um, features. Um, so I found that that's really helpful too and interesting also to see what people are seeing around our state. Um, because normally we wouldn't find any Baltimore Orioles in Wisconsin in the wintertime, but through the Facebook birding group, I've been able to keep track of a Baltimore Oriole that's been seen uh, pretty regularly in the central part of the state for the last month about. Um, so it's cool to see what's, what's being seen around the state uh, that you wouldn't normally know about. All right, so just to wrap up, um, why, why did I 
get into birds or why do I think birds are so cool? Um, since I work at the Aldo Leopold Nature Center, I wanted to plug in an Aldo Leopold quote. Uh, one of his famous lines is, I love all trees, but I am in love with pines. I think I would rewrite that to, I love all of nature, but I am in love with birds. Um, and I think birds are amazing just because they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, and they have uh, all sorts of habitats that they live in, um, and just uh, the amazing adaptations that birds have. Uh, whether it's a peregrine falcon flying 230 miles an hour uh, or a hummingbird that can fly backwards. I think uh, birds have all sorts of cool uh, adaptations. And another thing that I think is really cool uh, is birds connect us to other places around the world. I can be looking at a Baltimore Oriole in my backyard that a few months ago might have been in someone else's backyard in Brazil. Um, and that's just really cool to me. Um, that connects connects people and connects the land um, to see how bird migration works and that's really cool. Um, the rose-breasted grosbeak, if you notice that picture, is uh, when I was little uh, we had a bird feeder at my house um, and that's when my interest in birds first started um, because I would just sit and look out the window my parents didn't know a lot about birds, but they had a bird feeder, and it was cool to watch. And living in an urban environment, we would often get house sparrows and finches, and that's about it. Uh, but one day I saw that bird fly up to the feeder, and I ran excitedly to go tell my parents. By the time I came back with them, it was gone. And I tried to explain to them what it looked like, and I could tell that they didn't really believe me. Uh, so I, I got our bird guide. I found it. I would page through it. And I found a match, and I said, this is a bird. It's a rose-breasted grosbeak. And again, they're like, we've never seen that bird at our feeder. I, I don't know if that's true. And right as we were looking at the page, it came back, landed on the feeder, and I said, aha, I knew I was right. Uh, from kind of that moment on, I was, I was hooked on birds, seeing that beautiful rose-breasted grosbeak come to our feeder in an urban environment where I'm only seeing house sparrows and finches. Um, it was cool to see it uh, visit our feeder. Um, and uh, another story just about uh, bald eagle. Uh, we were at uh, my last year in college. Uh, my bird, uh, I don't know, my bird knowledge wasn't what it is now. Uh, and I was in a class called Birding to Change the World. Um, and we were paired up with middle school students. We would go out to a park and we would just explore nature and have fun. Um, it was a really cold day. None of us really wanted to be outside. It was early in the morning, um, and we were just kind of looking at the water. We were supposed to be looking for different types of ducks, and we weren't really seeing much, and we got around to this corner, and we finally saw a group of ducks that were feeding, and we're sitting there trying to figure out what they are, but we're kind of miserable because it's cold and windy, and uh, all of a sudden, all the ducks went under water, and we're like, oh, that's weird. Did we scare them? And right over our heads, a bald eagle swooped down, 10 feet over our heads. And all of us were just like shocked. And the, bird, or the bald eagle flew off. It didn't get a duck. Uh, but I think that was another moment that I can look to and be like, all right, that got me hooked on birds again. Um, and since then, I've been out looking for as many birds as I can find. Uh, these are just a couple. Uh, of my favorite pictures that I've taken over the last couple of years um, out birding. Um, yeah, you can bird. I don't. Uh, I have, yep, well, it's not a phone. I have a Nikon power shoot, uh, but I got it refurbished for about $120, which in the camera uh, market is really on the low end. Um, so, yeah, if, if you want to. Uh, get a camera that really helps too with identifying birds. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to, as an environmental educator, uh, part of my passion is inspiring other people to just get outside and find what they love in nature. Um, find, find that moment when you're outside um, and you realize, all right, this is why people bird. This is why people get outside and explore. Um, I can't tell you when that moment will be or what it will be, but I know if you get outside and if you are exploring nature, that moment 
uh, will come uh, where it hits you. Can you identify? I'm not, I'm not a bard. <laughs> yep, yeah, so the upper left is a barred owl. Um, another common owl that we see other than the great horned owl um, around here. Um, obviously the cardinal. That is a baby goose, um, so a gosling. At the nature center, we often have geese that nest um, at our pond. Um, so we have lots of little goslings running around. Uh, the bottom left is a northern flicker that was kind of playing peekaboo with me. Um, bottom center, sandhill cranes um, that were coming to, uh, this was at Nine Springs Park, if anybody's ever heard of that, Nine Springs Natural Area. There's some ponds there, and the cranes will congregate in the evening because they sleep standing in the water at night. Um, so it was cool to see them coming in at sunset. Uh, and then this I just took two weeks ago uh, at Picnic Point, uh, UW Lakeshore Path. That's a great horned owl. And then I also gave you guys a list of my favorite places to visit. Um, that's on the back of your handout. Um, I'm sure most of you have been to some of these locations, but I just tried to give you guys a list of everything um, that, that I like to go to, and there's plenty more. We're really lucky in Madison to have so many parks um, that are accessible and available for people to visit. Um, we can definitely we see. Yeah. <laughs> we got to see them every single day. Awesome. And then we'd walk to schools and see them that way. Uh, it is cool to see. I notice people find connections with sandhill cranes because they're often in pairs and they hang out in the same spot. And they, and, and they do walk funny, and it's cool. It's cool to see. Um, and actually, just last week, we were starting to see the first sandhill cranes returning from migration. Um, <laughs> Yeah, they're in for a rude awakening when they uh, find the, the cold weather that's coming in this weekend and the snow. But they'll, they'll find food. They like to eat uh, in the springtime and summer. They'll eat like little um, know, crustace crustaceans in the pond or insects, um, frogs, turtles. Um, so they'll supplement their diet until we start seeing that in the springtime. <laughs> Hmm. Probably the most rare one I've seen is called a white-faced ibis. Um, that was, uh, and I knew that it was in the area. That was actually at Nine Springs too. Um, there's lots of good birds at Nine Springs, depending on the time of year. Um, I found out about it through the Wisconsin Facebook group. Someone said I saw a white-faced ibis at Nine Springs yesterday. Uh, so. I went the next day to try to find it, and I saw it, and it was really cool. And it's usually, uh, it's a small bird with a really long beak that wades along shorelines, and it's usually way south, um, like in Florida normally. Um, but it got blown off course or wanted, wanted to take a trip maybe and uh, <laughs> ended up here. Um, so that's probably the most rare one. Yeah. Uh, this year was actually a pretty low year for snowy owls sometimes. Um, so the years vary. Uh, if we have a lot of snowy owls in a winter, it's called an eruption. Um, and this year it was not. Um, and that's dependent on the food source that they have living up in the tundra um, in Canada. Um, so if you go to the right spots, um, there are a couple, and you can use eBird uh, to find where snowy owls have been seen. Um, I went about an hour north um, to an area called Buena Vista Grasslands where they had been spotted for most of the winter. Spent a day, day there and I didn't see any. Um, but they, they have been seen in a couple spots around Wisconsin. But some years their, their numbers are, are really large. Um, yeah. Years ago I went to the school pilot out by Verona and that was the first time I saw a starlet tanager. Oh, nice. They're one of my favorite summer birds to see, the, the black and red, very striking. Yeah, yep. Yeah, they're really cool birds to see. Um, and you could see those. I saw a scarlet tanager uh, multiple times at Olin Park, Olin Turville, last spring. If you walk through the woods that they have there, um, I saw a scarlet tanager 
um, a handful of times there. So it's really cool to see all all these birds that we can see in Madison, especially in May. Yeah. Yes. Um, so the house sparrow was introduced in the, I believe it was the late 1700s, early 1800s. Um, they're from Europe, um, and they were on boats uh, that came over uh, from Europe. And they established a population, and invasive species um, tend to outcompete native species just because through evolution, native species haven't had time to uh, adapt to the species that are being introduced. Um, so they would, uh, they're considered generalists. They, they're not very picky um, on where they are, what they eat. Uh, they do prefer urban environments, but they'll kind of take over uh, birdhouses, bird nests, uh, different areas, um, and they just, the numbers of house sparrows are pretty incredible. Um, their population has just exploded. Um, so they're considered non-native and invasive um, because they're taking spots of, of native birds. Um, so they're usually not my favorite bird to see outside, but I understand that they're still a bird that, that's cool. The house finch, I don't know the backstory to. Um, no. no. Well, it's interesting in the sense that I can remember when I first saw one of those. I worked at the VA hospital, went outside in the summer to eat lunch, and what is this bird I'm hearing? And I saw it. And we looked in the bird book, uh, <coughs> Peterson, mm -hmm. or Yeah. The story that because of its very nice song, people had taken them to New York City area and had them in cages. Yep. And some escaped, and they just kept spreading this way. Yep. Yeah. So that that happens with a lot of introduced species. They they just kind of find a niche and then they they take off. Um, that reminds me of the the starling, the European starling story. Uh, which dates back to, again, 17, 1800, 1800s, I think, or maybe even a little bit later, late 1800s. Uh, there was a guy in New York that really liked Shakespeare, and the European starling was in Shakespeare. And so he brought some over from Europe and wanted to have like a little colony of uh, European starlings. I think it failed about six times, and then on like the seventh time, finally had a a population of starlings in his backyard or area wherever he was and now millions and millions of starlings everywhere um, and they're they're kind of cool because they do what's called murmuration where they're in a big flock and if you ever see a huge flock of blackbirds that's kind of going back and forth and it's amazing how they can all be in sync with one another uh, but most of the time that's going to be the starling that you see Yep, those are very closely tied together in their arrival dates. Um, I don't know if it has anything to do with they want to migrate together or uh, they do, um, but I think the average average arrival date for the rose-breasted grosbeak and the Baltimore Oriole is right around the same day in May. Do you think it's like food related or maybe yep. how they fly, so wind conditions? Yep, yeah, and migration. Uh, with different species, it all depends on what food source they're eating, um, what exactly their flight pattern is, um, can they find the food that they're wanting to eat in Wisconsin at that time, and then they'll, they'll stop and get the food. Um, and also rose-breasted grosbeaks and orioles nest in Wisconsin in the summer, so they're not just passing through. 
Um, so you'll see them in, in greater numbers in the, in the spring and summer. Um, but yeah, May uh, is a great time to get out to see as many birds as you can. That's when a lot of them are passing through to nest in either northern Wisconsin or keep going up to Canada, uh, or a lot of uh, the species will nest in Wisconsin too. Um, but there's lots of different types of warblers that come through. Um, and the yeah, rose-breasted grosbeak and Baltimore Orioles, lots of, lots of cool, color, colorful birds coming through um, in the spring and summer. Yeah. Um, you also made a, um, a reference to the natural animosity between owls and crows. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the great horned owls are predators of crows, um, and especially young crows. Um, and crows are actually very smart. Uh, there's lots of cool videos if you want to check out crows online, um, how smart they really are. They do some really cool things. Um, but they will uh, mob uh, great horned owls if they see predators around uh, or other types of owls. So they'll just get in a huge group, and they'll just be as noisy and annoying as they can to try to mob that, that owl out of there, that predator. Uh, a lot of times I find owls based on uh, crows telling me where they are um, with their, their mobbing. Uh, but their goal is to just get the, get the owl out of their territory. Um, They're not eating the same thing, are they? Well, the owls will eat the crows. So that's, yeah, owls are predators of crows. <laughs> Crackles are kind of cool. I mean, they do take over in the. Find it pretty, but man, yeah. I never see so much bird poop on my they do purple. They do. Uh, they do leave behind a lot of a lot of poop. <laughs> they're they're pretty messy, but I, I don't know how to uh, how to make that stop. Yes. Yep. Yeah. They don't really have manners when it comes to eating from the yeah, from the bird. Okay, that's it for a while. Yeah. They take it down, and then they give up. Mm -hmm. And then I wait for a while, and I put it back in. Yeah. Okay, that's it. Sorry, I am not. Yeah. Yeah. Usually in the summertime, birds are good at finding their own their own food anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And they're, they're not puppy kids. Yeah. Yes. As long as we're doing the bird talking here, um, I had an aunt who uh, lived down in Orange County, and she liked hummingbirds. And so she put feeders out for them. And she did, I asked her, I said, what year did you do that? She said it was 1968. And then she had them back every year. And then her and her husband moved. They just, just kept a little, like, quarter-acre of property and built a new house there. Mm -hmm. Sold their house and all the farm and property. But they moved the feeders up so they could have the hummingbirds up there with them. And they're the coolest things to see. They're, they're about this big and they go... Yep. So everybody should do that here. Everybody yeah. should. I'm going to do that this year, see if I can get some. Yeah, they're really cool. And there are many different types of hummingbirds. Oh yeah, that's that's a good that's a good one to plant. But we we really only see one species of hummingbird here, the ruby throated. Is ninety nine percent of the time the only hummingbird we'll see here. Isn't that the only kind that comes to Wisconsin? Is ruby throated? Yeah, uh, there's a couple that uh, during migration might pass through, um, but yeah, almost every single time. If you see a hummingbird in Wisconsin, it's the ruby throated. They, yeah, they do. Yeah, they make little chirping noises at each other, and yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny to see. <laughs> Story about 
that, that bald eagle that flew by you like that? Yeah. You said you didn't get a duck. Well, I'll bet you with girls there, they probably duck. <laughs> I, I ducked too. <laughs> Why not? I want everyone to thank Brian for a crystal ball. Thank you guys. Uh yeah, so if you look at the bird and nature handouts, um I lead maybe one a month, random uh, random spots. It's not always at the Nature Center. Um, but if you were to stop by at the Aldo Leopold Center, we rent out binoculars if you want to borrow them. Um, and if I'm free, I'm always happy to go on a bird hike. Um, but yeah, we also have the, the listed ones. And that's through the Madison Friends of Urban Nature. Um, and I'll, I'll lead a couple of those, but th there's lots of good uh, leaders that lead those hikes. Um, lots of very, uh, yep, so every month uh, the list is, there's I think seven different locations. Um, so the first Saturday is at Tenney Park, um, first Sunday is at Cherokee Marsh, and then that whole list, so that's every single month that, that happens. Um, usually we have groups about 10 to 20 people, but on really nice days in the spring, I've had up to 100 people come for a hike. Um, so yeah, it's, it's cool to see everybody in your community uh, just get out and explore nature. Yeah, thank you guys. Enjoy your birding.